Hi, everybody. Um, good evening. Um, welcome to our fourth um, community medical school. I'm Paula Tracy. I'm a professor here um, in the Department of Biochemistry, and um, I'm here tonight because I want to introduce to you a very good friend and an outstanding colleague, and that's Mary Cushman. And um, she's a professor, as you can see. Um, yes, she's a professor of medicine, but she's also a professor of pathology. She is also an outstanding clinician, as you can see, in being the director of the thrombosis and hemostasis program. Um, so why was it important for me to do this? It was important for me to do this because I'm confident it will be enjoyable. I'm confident that we'll learn a great deal. And I'm confident that you'll go out of here wanting to educate all your friends with respect to Life Simple 7. Um, so just a few comments about Mary because she is an internationally recognized scientist. Um, she is on several editorial boards. She has published over 350 articles in her 16-year career, which means that that's more than 20 articles a year, which um, is no small feat um, in the research arena. Um, I'd also like to tell you that she's very dynamic and she is a tremendous advocate and has great passion for the American Heart Association. Um, which is one of the reasons that she's here tonight. Um, she has uh, recently been elected to the National Board of Directors of the American Heart Association, which is a, um, it's a wonderful tribute um, to what she has done for the American Heart Association. And um, I'd also like to mention that this is not her first, but it's her third community medical school. And the reason for that is because, as you will see, she will do a great job. Um, she is the president of our local AHA board as well and has always been involved in the community activities, not limited to the most recent Heart Walk on Saturday. And so I would like to introduce my friend and colleague to you, Mary Cushman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, I think the first time I gave this talk, a community medical school talk, um, Dr. Tracy and I gave the talk together. And it was great fun and really wonderful. And she's a role model to me. And I'm really grateful that she's here to introduce me. So I'm going to talk about something called the Simple Seven. And you've probably been wondering what that is. And maybe some of you Googled it before you came because you were curious. I'm going to fill you in completely all about what it is and why it exists. And that's my goal for the talk. Um, I'd like to get you excited about it. And if you have a pen, um, and I know you have paper because you have the handout, I'd like you to jot down any ideas that you might have as we go through the slides. And thinking about how you might take home to your family, or your neighborhood, or your church, or your community, some little piece of what I've told you today with, with some kind of idea for an action plan for helping to improve the health of yourself, or those that you love, or those that you hang around with in your social arena. So, so if you get ideas, jot them down as we go along. And maybe we'll be able to discuss those at the end. So first, I'm going to tell you about what the problem is with cardiovascular disease and why it's very important for all of us to care about it. And then I will reveal what Life Simple 7 is. And I'll review some research that we've been doing on this over the last couple of years. Research that's very different from the type of research I've done in the past, but which was inspired by the tool itself. And then talk about what we all can do any of us can do, um, whether we're professional medical people or not, what we can do to improve health. So this slide shows a picture of the circulation of the heart. And you can see that um, there's black in the middle. So the heart muscle has been taken away, and you can just see the blood vessels. And so when, heart, when blood gets pumped out of the heart to the aorta to be distributed throughout the body, there are these arteries that come off 
the aorta, called the coronary arteries, and those feed the heart with the oxygenated blood, so the nutrients can go to the heart muscles. And a heart attack is simply um, an episode where one of those arteries gets blocked with a blood clot forming in an area of damage to the artery or atherosclerosis to the artery. And that's shown in more detail here. So here you can see we've taken one of those arteries and just cut it across. And you can see the blood elements are flowing through. The, the artery is clean and normal. And here you see a microscopic picture of the same type of artery from an autopsy specimen of a person who had a heart attack that they died from. And what you see as you're looking across the same view here is this area over here of damage that's coated by a, a cap in blue. That's an atherosclerotic lesion. And that lesion has ruptured open. It's a lipid-filled or cholesterol-filled lesion, and it's opened up, and a blood clot has filled the lumen or the opening. And so the blood flow ceases, and oxygen is not delivered to that part of the heart, and that's what a heart attack is. And it can be fatal when it's large enough or if it causes electrical disturbance. And this is an autopsy specimen of what the heart muscle looks like when it has experienced this damage. So you can see um, the red heart muscle here. We've cut, again, just across the heart itself, so like this. And you can see all this white stuff here, which is the tissue that has um, been infarcted or um, lost its blood supply. So it's no longer red or pink um, and viable tissue. The other cardiovascular disease that's very important that we're going to talk about is stroke. And stroke is simply the same sort of thing for the most part. There's five kinds, so it's a little more complicated. But it's the same sort of thing happening in the brain. So you have the carotid arteries bringing blood up to the brain and then branching into other vessels. And sometimes there are these same kinds of atherosclerotic lesions in the carotid arteries. And little pieces of clot or atherosclerotic debris can break off and travel up into these very small vessels in the brain. And that's shown here. And in the same fashion, the flow of blood stops. And that area of the brain becomes damaged. The oxygen isn't going to it. The nutrients aren't going to it. And it's the same idea as, as a heart attack. And there are other types of stroke, but the most common types involve this sort of thing occurring. One in six people will have a stroke in their lifetime. I think most of you probably know that heart attack and heart disease are the number one killer of people. But stroke occurs in one in six people over the course of their lifetime. So it's also very common. In fact, it's the fourth leading cause of death. So it's extremely important. It's the leading cause of disability. When people survive a stroke, and they have neurologic damage because part of their brain has, has basically died, so they get paralysis or, or what have you, or they can't speak. Um, that's a severe disability, and it's the leading cause of disability in our country. So the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, which is basically the same thing, um, has a campaign going on now to help people learn about the symptoms of stroke. And it's called Spot a Stroke. You might have seen. Um, public service announcements on television, you can see them online. If you Google, you know, spot a stroke, you'll see these nice videos that talk about this, but I've seen commercials on TV for it. And FAST is the way that we're trying to help people understand and to remember the symptoms of stroke. So if you can remember FAST, you'll know that a stroke can cause facial drooping, such as shown here, and it, they can occur in young people, such as this woman arm weakness or clumsiness, um, speech difficulty. And if you have any of these things, it's time to call 911. And that's why FAST is such a perfect way to remember this, because you need to get to medical care. The longer you wait, the less likely your brain will be able to recover, because um, you need treatment, optimal treatment given as soon as possible. There are other kinds of stroke symptoms, but these are the most common that occur. Um, I also want to point out, in understanding just the scope of this disease, that a lot of people don't realize that heart disease is also the leading cause of death in women as well as men. 
So it's just as important for women to be aware of it as it is for men. And some people don't realize this. So I just have a slide to, to cover that. Um, the leading causes of death in US women in 2009 are shown here. And coronary heart disease, as I showed you the picture of, um, caused 24% of the deaths. Cancer, 22% of the deaths, with lung cancer being the most common. Stroke, 6%. Lung disease, 6%. Alzheimer's, 5%. So you can see it's the predominant cause of death among women. And once women are postmenopausal, um, they catch up to men. Um, and their risk um, in older age is similar to that of a man. This means about half a million women die every year of heart disease or stroke. So um, I have heart disease itself, sorry. Half a million. And if you look at women plus men, it's nearly a million who die of, of heart disease each year. What can we do about this? It's a major, major health problem. And we've made a lot of progress over the years, as I'm going to show you. But the best way to deal with this and change these statistics is prevention. Treatment is critically important, but prevention is the best way to deal with this disease, or these two diseases. So what are the milestones in prevention? What do we know about how to prevent these problems? In 1960, we learned that smoking caused heart disease. 1960. In 1961, that high cholesterol and high blood pressure caused heart disease. In 1967, that physical activity lowers the risk and obesity increases the risk. In 1970, that high blood pressure increases the risk of stroke. High blood pressure is the single most important risk factor for stroke. In 1978, that psychosocial factors affect heart disease as well. Depressive symptoms can increase the risk. Now, we've known all these things since I was a kid. But we aren't always as good about making these things happen in the healthcare system that we have and in our society. Um, in fact, we've gone totally backwards in, in some areas, as I will show you. Once we identified the risk factors, we have had multitudes of studies to tell us that control of these risk factors um, is key to reducing the vascular disease risk. We call that primary prevention. You don't have to really remember that, but we call it primary prevention. When you say a person who's never had a heart attack, you diagnose them with high blood pressure, or you find that they're a smoker, you do efforts to take care of those things. That's primary prevention, prevention of a first event. Most of our success in reducing death rates from these diseases has been in the setting of secondary prevention where we provide optimal treatments at the time of an event, the time of a heart attack or the time of a stroke, to prevent a person from dying from that stroke or heart attack, and to help them not have another one. So secondary prevention, very, very effective. We're really, really good at it. As long as people come to care, we're really good at it. Now, of course, some people don't have the chance to get to care because they have such large events that they die suddenly. But most, if not many, if not most, cardiovascular events occur in people who do not have major risk factors. They have modest increased levels of their risk factors or no risk factors at all. And so what can we do for those people to help them be as healthy as possible? And primordial prevention is the answer there. Primordial prevention means preventing the risk factors from developing in the first place. So preventing the onset of high blood pressure or of diabetes preventing kids from starting to smoke, preventing that addiction of smoking. So th these are efforts in primordial prevention, and we're going to talk a lot about that this evening. So um, around 1999, the American Heart Association developed its 2010 impact goal. Now, this is something that um, societies like this that are, are um, health, American Heart Association is a voluntary healthcare organization. Their mission is to build healthier lives free of heart disease and stroke. That's their mission. And they set goals every 10 years to help guide them in what they're going to do, what, what activities they will do to build, to reach to that mission of uh, building health, healthier lives free of cardiovascular disease and stroke. So around 1999, um, the board of directors set this goal for 2010, to reduce coronary heart disease and stroke death and risk by 25% by 2010. And I remember I was a relatively young person involved in leadership at that time. And I remember when this was released, I was kind of snickering and saying, I can't believe that's possible to do. It just seems too big. 
of a reduction to make over a 10-year period. But in fact, there was pretty good success, and this slide shows that. So what you can see here is the trajectories of death from heart disease and stroke, so CHD is heart disease and stroke, the rate of uncontrolled high blood pressure, and the prevalence or the rate of high cholesterol in the population. And here you see the reduction that occurred over time from 2004 to 2008 in the United States. The um, line with the diamond here, right along here, is heart disease. And you see, by 2007, it was down to be more than 25% lower, the death rates from heart disease. Similarly, for stroke, you see right around just after 2007, the 25% reduction in stroke death rates was achieved. Similar for high blood pressure, you see in the diamond, or the triangles here, I do know my shapes, um, <laughs> making sure you're awake, um, that it also went down. By 2008, it was more than 25% lower, and high cholesterol as well. Um, just at the 25% mark by 2008. So for these factors, the goal was achieved early, in fact. And I remember being at a meeting when this was announced, and I was thinking, wow, <laughs> I didn't think it was possible. And this wasn't the kind of work I was doing um, in terms of you know, public health interventions and that sort of thing. So I was really amazed by this. I thought it was, was quite remarkable. However, we've had an obesity epidemic um, over the last 20 years. And diabetes and obesity increased over this time. And that was a total failure. And this slide shows what happened with obesity in the United States between 1985 and 2007. Um, I'm going to play this as a movie for you. And what you're going to see is the states turning colors based on how, uh, what the um, prevalence or the rate of obesity was in that state. So the blue colors are the lower states. And then as the colors get more orange and red, those are the higher rates. States with red color have more than a 30% rate of obesity. And I just want you to watch this. You can see the years going by. And look what's happened to us. Now, that's 2007. I can tell you it's much worse now. It has continued. About a third of Americans are obese. About a third are overweight. And about a third are normal, based on the CDC's definition of obesity, which is a body mass index over 30. So this is a tragedy in this country. It's not just our country. Mexico has now become the most obese country in the world. Um, you can see, you can't see Vermont up there, but Vermont is not too bad. Um, but we're worse than most other countries. <laughs> um, we're worse than Brazil. We're worse than most of Europe. Um, we pride ourselves in Vermont on being healthy compared to the rest of the country. You always see in the news stories about Vermont um, having good health, which is wonderful. I don't mean to knock that at all. But, um, but this country is completely out of control with the obesity epidemic. And what it's leading to is the onset of diabetes, um, which is a major problem. So for 2010, then, um, the Heart Association and its partners, you know, the government and other similar agencies that care about this stuff, were very happy to achieve these successes, but some mixed results when it comes to the risk factors. So they then plan the next decade. What are you going to do to make it better? What can we do to, to keep this thing moving? And over the course of this decade, of the, the 2000 to 2010, um, this very interesting research was published by a colleague of mine, Don Lloyd-Jones, at Northwestern University. And what he did is looked at a population of, of men and women, a large population, thousands of people, who were tracked over time. And he looked at age 50 at their risk factor level, their profile at age 50, and then followed them over time um, as they aged to see how long they lived free of cardiovascular disease. And on the y-axis here, you see the incidence, which means the rate of development of cardiovascular disease over time as a person is aging. 
And what you see in the, in the blue color here for men, if a man at age 50 has optimal levels of all the risk factors, the cardiovascular risk factors, the ones I've been sort of mentioning, um, the chance of the, that he's going to die of cardiovascular disease is 5%. If a woman has optimal levels at age 50, it's similar, about 8%. But if you have even one factor that's not optimal, it doesn't mean that you have a major risk factor like diabetes, but just one that's not optimal. So not optimal blood pressure is um, between 130 and 140 over between 80 and 90. That's a suboptimal blood pressure, even though it's not hypertension or high blood pressure. Even one of those are not optimal. Look at how it goes up, 36%, 27%. Huge increase just with that. And as you count the worsening risk factor levels going up these lines, there's a higher rate of death from cardiovascular disease. Men with two or more risk factors by age 50 having a 69% chance of dying of cardiovascular disease and women a 50% chance. Now it's the number one killer, so of course these numbers are expected to be high. But the bottom line here is that if you can prevent the onset of the development of these risk factors, you're gonna live longer free of cardiovascular disease. So very important research finding um, illustrated on this slide. So given that information and other um, research results, um, mostly funded by the National Institutes of Health, which is closed today, um, unfortunately, um, the Heart Association convened a group of experts of science volunteers, people like myself, I wasn't on the committee, but people who volunteer their time to help advance the science to set goals for 2020 and figure out how we can measure this concept of health. So the board of directors dictated to this group that they wanted this goal, shown on this slide, to be the impact goal for 2020. And the goal is to improve the cardiovascular health of all Americans by 20% while reducing deaths from cardiovascular diseases and stroke by 20%. So the second part is sort of the same as before, pretty much exactly the same. Um, it's just 20 instead of 25. And the first part, is a little different. It's not to reduce risk, it's to improve health. We want to promote the idea that people can live more healthfully, okay? Not just be thinking about risk all the time. So improve the cardiovascular health, and this all Americans, I put it in pink because it means everyone. It means men, women, children, adults, and people of all race, ethnicity, groups, people who live in rural areas, urban areas, it means everyone. So we wanna track the health of the, of the country and, get, and, and really reach people who are affected by disparities. People living in um, certain regions of the country have disparities in their health status. Um, people of, of um, minority eth race ethnicity groups have disparities. Um, African Americans have nearly two times the death rate of stroke of white Americans for reasons we don't fully understand. So we need to improve um, the health of everyone. So the challenge was defining this concept of cardiovascular health. So I'm getting closer to the simple seven that I talked about at the beginning. So what is cardiovascular health? So this group of scientists got together and said, okay, here it is. Um, they did a lot of work, had a lot of conference calls, had in-person meetings, and they decided to define it as the absence of disease favorable levels of what they call health factors and favorable health behaviors. Well, what does this mean? The health behaviors, these things, most of you know these things. I don't really have to tell you. Non-smoking, a healthy weight, good levels of physical activity, a healthy eating pattern. What are the health factors? They're not risk factors anymore, they're health factors. A normal level of cholesterol, normal blood pressure, and not diabetic. So we're emphasizing the positive. So it turned into this metric called Life Simple 7. And what the group did was categorized um, definitions of ideal levels of health for each of these seven factors that I showed you on the previous slide. And so what you see on this slide are the definitions of ideal health status for each of the seven things. So we have never smoking, or quit more than a year ago. So if you quit, you can be ideal. 
Just because you've smoked before doesn't mean you're going to always be unhealthy from it. That's why it's good to quit. Body mass index less than 25, which is our classification of overweight. Physical activity, more than 150 minutes a week of moderate activity or 75 minutes of vigorous. This is actually a little less than um, government recommendations, but it's, um, it's what they came up with as a definition for ideal. Um, four to five components of a healthy diet, which I'll show you what that is on the next slide, or a couple slides from now. Cholesterol, and then the health factors. Cholesterol less than 200, blood pressure less than 120 over 80, and blood sugar less than 100. So these are the ideal levels. Um, there are um, definitions for children that are different than adults because kids have different values, different distributions. Um, for example, for smoking, it's that they never smoked or they haven't tried in the last month. You know, we know if a kid tries smoking, they're likely to get hooked on it and addicted to it. So haven't tried in the last month is, is the metric, the main one that I wanted to point out here. The second one that's important to point out is the physical activity one because it's more than what's expected of adults. 60 minutes a day of moderate or vigorous physical activity. So um, kids need more. So this is the diet metric. Now you don't see calories on here. You see foods. It's a little different emphasis than what we've been thinking about as we've been getting fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter. <laughs> So um, we're asking people to think about the foods they're eating. So um, this is the definition of the metric. You need four or five of these to be ideal. Two or three are intermediate. And zero or one are poor. So you see fruits and vegetables, four and a half cups a day. Fish, um, more than two, two or more servings a week of three and a half ounces. Fiber-rich whole grains. Um, three or more one ounce servings per day. Sodium, less than 1,500 milligrams. That's really low. This has created a lot of controversy and stories in the media about the Heart Association has it wrong, they're shooting too low, low sodium can be bad for you, and none of that's true. Um, so this is the threshold that has been set, which is actually very difficult to, to achieve, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then the sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, less than 450 calories per week, or 36 ounces per week. And I'll talk more about that in a moment as well. So for each of these seven factors, I don't expect you to be able to see this slide. We do have a handout outside um, at the Heart Association table with all of these numbers in it, if you want to have that on a piece of paper. But basically, for each of the seven factors, people can be categorized as poor, intermediate, or ideal. Okay, and our goal is to move people up, to have a 20% overall movement of people to a higher level. And that's just shown here. So we want to move people either from poor to intermediate or intermediate to ideal and have a 20% overall movement across all these boxes. Okay, so that's the goal. The new aspects, I've kind of alluded to them. We've defined cardiovascular health, really for the first time. This, these seven things comprise health. And we've emphasized the movement of the population to a better level of health, a small incremental difference in the population. We're only looking, for example, to shift the blood pressure of the whole population, just a tiny amount, because we know um, that that will have benefits to the whole population in general. So what's the current status? So this is where we get into our research. And when I first heard about this simple seven, I was amazed. I thought, wow, I was sitting in Dallas actually at the Heart Association at a meeting and it was presented and discussed. This is a meeting of the science leaders of the organization. And I was blown away. I thought this is just so cool. I'm so proud of my colleagues who came up with this. It's so simple, it's easy. People can get their brain around it. I'm gonna start researching it because I wanna learn more about what it actually means to the population. So we have this study that we've been working on since around 2001. It's called REGARDS. Um, it has a logo. REGARDS stands for Reasons for Geographic and Racial Differences in Stroke. I mentioned earlier that African Americans have higher stroke death rates than whites. 
We also know that stroke death rates are higher in the southeast, the region we call the stroke belt. And so we're studying why these disparities exist. So we have this great resource. It's a study that has over 30,000 people in it, black and white individuals who are 45 or older when we enrolled them in their homes between 2003 and 2007. We did extensive questionnaires, dietary history, we did physical exam, and we collected blood and urine samples, which all are up here in Vermont. My role of the study is to be the laboratory, but I'm not gonna talk about the laboratory research that we're doing. And this shows where the people live. The blue dots are the black people, and the red dots are the white people. And you can see that we oversampled the southeast, because we're studying the geographic difference. So we wanted to have half the people in the southeast and half the people in the rest of the country so we can study this geography problem. And you can see there are some Vermonters um, in the study. There's about seven of them, which is kind of nice. Um, so we took the people in the study who did not already have cardiovascular disease, and we evaluated what the status was for the Life Simple 7 metric for each of the seven factors. And this slide shows the results. So it's the percent of people at um, ideal in green, intermediate in yellow, and poor in red. And you can see, um, for some of them, we're not too bad, like smoking, the number ideal is up over 80%. Um, the number of smokers is relatively small in this age group. But as you look across, you see a lot of yellow and red here, especially for diet. Look at that. You don't see any green. <laughs> it's really sad. Um, you don't see any green. And as I said, the diet metric is sort of stringent. Um, it's, it's sort of difficult to, to be ideal for it. Um, but we have a lot of room for improvement, right? If we can get people to make modest changes in their diet. Um, look at obesity, body mass index. Um, the red and yellow comprise the overweight or obese. It's like two-thirds of people in the study. Um, and actually, we weighted the results to U.S. population, actually. So it's not really the number in the study, but it's extrapolated to the distribution of people in the United States. So this actually represents the United States, not just our study participants. So I think what this tells us is we have a lot of room to improve, right? Um, we can do better in a lot of these things. We then took the Simple 7 and we made up a score for it. I'll show you how we did that in a moment, but the score, um, the way we made the score, we gave a person zero points for poor for each of the seven factors, one point for intermediate, and two points for ideal. So you can get 14 points on the score. The higher your score, the healthier you are. And this shows the distribution of the score. So in green, you see the white people, and in yellow, the black people. And this is the mean value here. So black people had a little lower score than the white people. And you can see um, the percent of people at each score. So for example, to interpret this, for a score of 15, about 19% of white people had a score of 15, and about 16% of black people had a score of 15. That's how you interpret this kind of histogram or, or bar graph. But you can see the scores tend to be higher in the white people here in green than in the black people here in yellow. More black people have poorer scores uh, than white people. This is the crux of the problem with health disparities. Blacks are more likely to die of heart disease and stroke, and um, this is one of the reasons. Our study is looking at a multitude of other reasons, but this is one of the reasons. So we now have the score, and we know what the current state is, but does the score predict the health outcomes? Does it do what we think it should do? And so we've been following the people in the study. We call them every six months, and we ask them how they're doing. And if we think it sounds like they've had a stroke or a heart attack or other health conditions or they've been in the hospital, we ask them why, and they tell us why, and we get their medical records, and we review those and classify their various illnesses. Well, most people, the outcome they care about the most is death, right? You want to live longer. You want to live healthier, but you want to live longer. So we started by looking at the association of, the, of Life Simple 7 status with death. And you're going to see a few other slides like this, and so I'll walk you through it. 
Um, the follow-up here was about five years from the time of enrollment, and we had about 1,100 people who had died by that time point. And what we're doing here is looking at the percent reduction in the risk of death, so the percent reduction in the chance that a person would die based on the number of ideal health factors of the seven. So it's just a simple count. How many ideal do you have? It ignores the intermediate and poor, you know, for, for now, um, but of the number of ideal. So if you have zero or one ideal, those are the least healthy people. They're the comparison group. We're gonna compare each of the other groups to those people, the people with the worst health. That's why you don't see any bar going down here. You just see this yellow blob up here. So if you have two or three ideal factors, you have a 36% chance, lower, uh, lower chance of dying over five years. If you have three or four, you've got a 49% lower chance, so half the chance of dying as a person with zero or one. And if you have six or seven ideal, um, you have a 54% chance, uh, less chance of dying than these people. So there's this stepwise um, improvement in survival based on how many ideal factors that you have, okay? And we've accounted for differences in a person's socioeconomic status and in their age, race, and sex in these analyses. So we're controlling for that. Um, I'm gonna show this slide only briefly to say there's other studies that are showing the same kind of data. Um, this is a study called NHANES, which is a government-funded project that does surveys of the population um, every so often. And um, this is all-cause death, just like we looked at, death from any cause. So what I just showed you is death, no matter what they died from, whether they were hit by a car or had cancer, although accidental death isn't very common. Um, you see that same sort of trend. Um, the slide is a little different, but that negative trend means the more ideal factors you have, the less likely you're, you're gonna die. And for cardiovascular death specifically, the trajectory is steeper. So the relationship of this metric with cardiovascular death is a little stronger than it is with all-cause death which you might guess because these risk factors are related um, to cardiovascular disease specifically. These are data from another study that I have been involved with called the ERIC study. And the ERIC study enrolled um, about 17,000 people in 1988 to 89 and has been following them ever since, funded by NIH, which is closed today, just to make sure you remember that. Um, <laughs> And in this analysis, we looked at the 20-year risk of cardiovascular disease events. Not death, but events or death. And the same kind of thing by the number of ideal factors. So this is the comparison group, people with none. And even having one ideal over a 20-year period, 35% less chance that you're gonna experience a cardiovascular event. And it goes on and on, the more ideal factors, the lower the chance, such that people who had seven ideal, there's very few of those. Um, in our study, in regards, there were two people out of 18,000 people that had seven, <laughs> two. Um, I think it was actually a problem of measurement. They probably didn't have seven, <laughs> but there were two. Um, but in this study, the, people, the few people who did have seven, nobody got a cardiovascular event over 20 years. So if you can achieve that, it's pretty good. Um, so very strong relationship. This slide is a little more complicated, but what it's showing us is that the behaviors and the health factors or risk factors are both important. So here you have the number of healthy behaviors, zero to four, and the number of health factors ideal, zero to three. And what you see, the, this is the rate of cardiovascular disease over 20 years in the study. The group that had three or four healthy behaviors and three um, ideal health factors had the lowest chance of having cardiovascular disease. And the highest risk group were the people who had neither present, zero and zero. But you see there's complementarity going on here. The health factors and the health behaviors both contribute together. And it's a very important concept. They're both important. So having absence of risk factors and having healthy behaviors like exercising are both important. And they add to each other. So um, 
actually, I've got the wrong reference here because this is a paper that just came out this spring, not in 2011, looking at the risk of stroke by the number of ideal factors. So we published this in um, July in the journal Stroke. And this shows in regards, we're back to our, our study with the map, um, the risk of stroke by the number of ideal factors, the same sort of setup. And this was based on follow-up of about five years with about 450 strokes that occurred in the people in our study. And again, these are the people with zero, and they're the reference group. They're the ones we're comparing everybody else to. And again, even one ideal factor being present, just one, you have a 30% less chance of stroke. With two, a 33% less chance, and a similar sort of trend going down. And again, the very few people with seven, I told you there were only a couple people, neither of them had a stroke. So they had 100% protection. Um, so suffice it to say, though, this metric is predictive of stroke as well. Um, this is the risk of going on dialysis. And again, I'm sorry, the, the citation is wrong here. This is a paper by a colleague of mine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Paul Muntner, who um, I collaborated with on this paper. He took the people in our study who had evidence on their lab tests of kidney disease, of mild, mostly mild kidney disease, and looked at the occurrence of them needing dialysis over the course of follow-up. And over um, about five or six years of follow-up, about 162 people who started with some kidney damage ended up on dialysis because their kidneys failed. And again, you see the same thing. It's related to kidney failure as well. Some of the risk factors for kidney failure are the same as the risk factors for heart disease and stroke, but, but not exactly. So very exciting and interesting findings. So the next thing, I told you we want to move people, we want to move the population just 20%. So any individual, we just want them to make a modest change. So the next question we asked was, does a small difference in this score make a difference? So I told you we made a score, and I've got a slide here that shows, um, I should have put that slide before as well, but it shows how we made our score. So we took the seven factors. For each factor, if you had, zero, if you had um, poor health, you got zero points. If you had intermediate, you got one point. And if you had ideal, you got two points. So you can have, if you're 14 points, you're one of those two people, <laughs> okay? And um, so you're healthier than people with lower scores. So we looked at the rate of all these different outcomes based on comparing people whose score was one point different from each other. So what this means is the score goes from zero to 14. We looked at the difference in, let me rephrase this. We looked at the difference in developing these various diseases based on a one point difference in score of people at the baseline. Now remember, we didn't intervene on them or make their scores go down. We're just comparing people at the beginning to each other. So compared to, so basically what this shows is that a difference of one point, so going from 10 to 11, or from eight to nine, or from two to three, was associated with reductions in all of these outcomes. So death was 18% lower chance, coronary heart disease, heart disease 23% lower chance, stroke 8% lower chance, kidney disease or dialysis, 22% lower chance. And I didn't show you other data, but we've measured cognitive function in this population as well. And the decline of cognitive function to a clinically significant level was also, also related to the simple seven. So if your score was one point better, you had a 10% lower chance of experiencing cognitive decline over about a five-year follow-up period. Very strong um, and exciting relationships with a variety of diseases. So if the Heart Association and its partners, because they're working with other societies like the Cancer Society, NIH, the Centers for Disease Control, if the goal is achieved, we would expect reductions in all of these diseases. If the relationships I showed you actually pan out and are causal, which we would think would be true. So that's why we're doing it, right? To reduce these diseases. I told you, primordial prevention, making people healthier to reduce disease. And I didn't show you data on cancer. We don't have it in our study, but there have been one or two papers published relating this metric to the occurrence of cancer as well. 
a lot of the risk factors are shared, especially the lifestyle ones, obesity, inactivity, poor diet, um, diabetes for some cancers, smoking, of course, smoking, <laughs> the leading preventable cause of death um, in our country, the number one public health threat. So what's going on? Are we doing it? It's, it's 2013, right? Are we making any progress here? And this slide just shows data from a population study that just has looked at the turn of the decade. So it's very early data. And use that data to project what's going to happen by 2020. And the projections are not very good because the projection is that we will have a 6% improvement in, in cardiovascular health, not 20%. And what it looks like so far that smoking, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure are improving, that obesity and glucose are worsening, not surprising, and that physical activity and healthy diet are not changing yet. So I can tell you this slide is going to be moving constantly because I think we are starting to see progress in some of these. We see reports on the news and such. So, um, so I'm optimistic that we will not end at 6% in 2020. We, I think we will achieve the goal, but it's going to be hard because we're not headed in the right direction, really, just partially. So the research conclusions of this part of the talk, then, are we have a huge opportunity to improve the population levels of health, and especially in African Americans, where we measured the status, but also in other groups. There's been studies on Hispanic Americans as well. Um, if we improve the population average by even one point, one factor or one ideal factor, you'd predict substantial reductions in these adverse health outcomes. We're going partly in the right direction, but it's up to all of us to think about how we can make a difference. I can tell you, this is not something doctors do in the office. I mean, they do, but, but everyone needs to think about this. We all need to think about it for ourselves and our families and the people we care about. And this is where we get into the interventions and how can we change what, what we kind of call the lifescape. The lifescape is just where a person is. The only way a person can change is if their lifescape changes. And you can divide that into kind of where you spend your time. It's in your home, your food environment, where you work, where you get health care, and in your community. I've put up just a few ideas for each of these things of changes that could occur that would help people be healthier. At home, you know, going out and playing with the kids after work, cutting the screen time, watch less TV. The foodscape is very, very difficult to control. Um, and I think um, partnerships with industry are going to be very important. I'm going to give you some examples on, on that. Um, because we eat so much stuff that's prepared for us. The workscape, having pleasant stairs at work. So you feel safe walking the stairs instead of taking the elevator. Um, it's clean. You know, you feel happy to be in the stairway. Um, having healthier food in the cafeteria. Putting the food in a place where people will choose the healthier ones. Like put the, the healthy foods at eye level. Make them have to get down on the ground to get the chips. Ooh, that, yeah. Did you hear that? <laughs> Um, the healthscape, work site wellness programs are hugely successful where you can get part of your health care at your workplace. You can get your blood pressure checked and basic preventive services. Um, the Affordable Care Act is really, really important because it, it, part of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare is that it provides preventive health care services that are covered. And this is critically important. Of course, it also in, ensures people with pre-existing conditions and a lot of other good stuff, um, but really critical. And the Affordable Care Act also funds this initiative called Million Hearts, which is run by the Centers for Disease Control, which aims to prevent 1.6 million heart attacks by 2060. Really important program. And they are launching um, a blood pressure awareness and control program to help educate the public about the importance of high blood pressure. So that's funded by Obamacare. So if, um, if the House defunds Obamacare, we're not going to have Million Hearts. We're not going to have preventive services, so very important. Um, the community scape, you know, safe bike lanes, walking paths, playgrounds. There's all kinds of things that you can put into a community that can make the environment healthier. Um, so what can we do? I've, I've hinted at a few of these. Public policy, 
um, industry partnerships, preventive services, and then nonprofit and community-based education and intervention programs. That's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> so what things work? What works? Well, this is called the healthcare pyramid or the health impact pyramid. And things at the bottom of the pyramid have the highest population impact on health. Things at the top of the pyramid require the most effort from individuals to make them work. So things at the bottom are improving socioeconomic factors. That's going to make for a healthier population. And up here is where we're really working, changing the context to make the default decision the healthy one, making it easy for people to be healthy, making them not even be aware that they're making healthier decisions because it's given to them. These are the things that we really need to do to improve health. Now, counseling and education is up here. Clinical interventions, what doctors do, is here. These are, are the least effective and require the most effort by the individual. Not that they're not important, but it's, they're not going to give us the bang for the buck that we need to achieve our goals. So policy examples, the most, the poster child of policy, um, in my view, is tobacco taxation. And this slide shows the, um, the wonderful relationship between cigarette sales and the price of cigarettes. Now, the price of cigarettes is completely controlled by the tax, okay, because the tobacco company, you know, makes it a certain price, and most of the cost of cigarettes is the tax. And what it shows from 1970 to 2009 that as the tax went up across the nation, that's green, this is nationwide data, the cigarette sales went down. It makes sense, right? If it's more expensive, you're less likely to buy it. This is especially true for children because they don't have the money. And this is amazing data. So this is the, again, the price of cigarettes here in green going up from 1991 to 2009. And you see the prevalence or the rate of smoking in 12th graders here in orange, this orange line, 35% in 1997 of 12th graders were smoking. It's now 18%, which still is completely unacceptable. Um, look at this, eighth graders, yellow, 18% in the mid-90s, it's now only 5%. They can't, they don't have the money. They can't get the cigarettes. So extremely effective. If children don't start, they will never become addicted and they won't die of lung cancer or cardiovascular disease or stroke or what have you. So um, the next one to talk about on a, of a potential policy initiative is dietary sugar. Um, how much sugar do we eat every day on average? Why are we fat? We eat 475 calories of dietary sugar. So you know, a healthy diet is 1,500 to, to 2,000 calories. So the sugar is really what's is driving this obesity epidemic. Um, how much is 475 calories? It's this much sugar. It's two-thirds of a cup. Okay, that's a lot. It's 30 teaspoons. Um, it's two and a half servings of a 12-ounce soft drink. So two and a half cans of whatever. Um, that's a lot. Um, so this is why part of that metric for diet included sugar sweetened beverages, okay? And um, it was based on the science behind dietary sugar. Um, one of the leaders in this field is here at the University of Vermont, Rachel Johnson, who led this American Heart Association statement about dietary sugars, where it was recommended that people curb their sugar intake. And the recommendation of the limit that most people should have for sugar, for excess sugar, um, is 100 calories for women, or six teaspoons a day, right here, or for men, 150 calories, or nine teaspoons. So a fraction of what we're currently taking in. 30%, 36% of all the added sugar in the diet comes from these beverages, okay? It's the leading contributor to the sugar intake. And this shows the sugar in various beverages. And I brought props. I have Amanda and Jesse, I think, in the room who are going to hand some of these out. This is the amount of sugar 
in a 20 ounce Coke. I would dare anybody to try to like put this down and maybe I should do that, what do you think? Um, but I'm gonna, we're passing these around so you can feel what it's like. Um, this single product, sugary beverages, accounts for 20% of the obesity epidemic. So that gross movie I showed you, 20% of that can be explained by this, by this particular class of products. So the Vermont chapter of the Heart Association um, believes that an excise tax is one way to reduce the consumption of these beverages because if there's a tax similar to cigarettes, there are less people would buy them, especially poor people who are price sensitive because they can't afford it. Poor people, of course, also have more obesity. So um, we believe that it could reduce obesity rates. And in Vermont, 25% of kids and 50% of adults are overweight or obese. Um, in terms of our costs for Medicare and Medicaid, half of our expenses can be linked to obesity, $160 million a year. So we've worked on this the last few years in the legislature and wasn't, weren't able to get it passed. But it's something we still care about because we think Vermont can lead the nation in this sort of policy initiative, uh, potentially to show the benefit. There's a lot of reasons why um, this works and I think I'm gonna sort of skip that for now in the interest of time and I'd be happy to speak with anyone about it. One of the big things is that soda um, or sugary beverages are liquid. They, you know, they don't fill you up, but they give you all the calories. So you drink it down and you're hungry <laughs> and then you go eat. And they don't make you hungry, but they don't fill you up. And the sugar goes into the liver and is sort of turned into fat, basically. And, and this is the problem. Um, my daughter doesn't drink sugary beverages, except on occasion, if we're out at a restaurant. Um, I bring diet soda into my house. I have no qualms about her drinking diet soda because I know in modest amounts there's no evidence that it's harmful to the health. And that's one of the, the things that people argue about, but there's no scientific evidence that it's harmful to health. So this is my daughter when she was little. She's 17 now, um, and, and she doesn't like sugary beverages. So I'm proud of that. Um, industry partnerships, what can we do with the industry to change the landscape, the foodscape? Sodium um, is a major cause of high blood pressure, sodium in the diet or salt in the diet. The lower the intake of salt, the lower your blood pressure and the lower the cardiovascular risk. No two ways about it. The sodium intake or the salt intake in the United States is twice that which is recommended. It causes about 100,000 100, deaths each year by itself. 70% um, of our dietary salt comes through processed food. Everybody always tells me when I'm talking to patients, oh, I don't use the salt shaker. Well, you know, that doesn't really matter. I mean, it does matter. It's good not to use the salt shaker, but we have very little control over our dietary sodium because 70% of it comes through processed food, the things we buy in boxes and cans. And so it limits our ability to make a change and we like it. We're actually addicted to it. Our taste buds are accustomed to it. We love it. Um, in the United Kingdom, um, they've been working on this for a number of years and the government partnered with industry to voluntarily reduce the amount of salt in food products. And that led to a nine and a half percent decrease in the population's intake of salt over just five years. Well, what does that mean? That doesn't sound like much, right? A nine percent decrease. But remember, when you're talking about prevention, we're just trying to move the needle a little bit. It's been projected that what that would lead to is that if you did it in the United States, the whole population blood pressure would be 1.25 millimeters of mercury lower. So very slight, right? You would never notice that difference if you were checking your blood pressure in the doctor's office. But it would prevent half a million strokes and half a million heart attacks over the lifetime of an adult, of the adult population age 40 to 85. So it would have a big impact. It would save $32 billion in medical costs. Just 1.25 millimeters of mercury lower blood pressure. So really an amazing impact if we could do similar sorts of things here. Well, I was really thrilled last week when this news came across um, on Facebook, I saw it. Um, 
so last week, McDonald's, in collaboration with a, with a nonprofit called the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, um, which advocates for obesity prevention in children, announced real huge changes in how they're going to approach their menu. So if you haven't heard about this, it's really fascinating. Um, it's starting to become cool and popular and desired to have healthier products. People want it. So McDonald's is responding with help from, from health advocacy organizations. So what they're doing is for your value meal, you know, the thing with the fries and the, the burger and the soda, um, they're going to have an option to get fruit, vegetable, or salad instead of fries. It's a small change, but I think it's significant for a company like this to do it. They're not going to put soda in the Happy Meal for kids. It's going to have milk, juice, or water. And the Happy Meal box, you know, with all the cartoons on it and stuff, it's going to have health messages for kids to read. These are huge foundational changes. And I think it's very exciting. And the Alliance for Healthier Generation is a fascinating organization. It was started by the Heart Association and the Clinton Foundation in 2007. And it does great work all around childhood obesity. It's really great. And of course, Burger King, now they've got Satis Fries. Now, <laughs> you've probably, they've been advertising it like crazy on television. I watch sports, so I see the ads. Um, new fries that have less calories and less fat and big taste. Um, and their CEO, or the president of Burger King said, small changes create a big impact. He's right. If someone eats at Burger King every day and they get these instead of the other, they're going to lose weight. I'm not advocating eating there, but, um, but a lot of people eat at these places. They can't afford to fill up anywhere else. So um, it's part of our society. Just don't eat more. <laughs> and the, the sad part about these satisfies fries is they charge more for them. I think it's 25 cents more. So what can an individual person do? I've told you what society might do or what companies might do, what the government might do. What can an individual do? Well, the Heart Association has made this tool available on a website. It's called My Life Check. And just over 400,000 people um, have participated in this so far. And the website is called mylifecheck.heart.org or mylifecheck.org. They both work. And it's a place you can go online and get your score for the Simple 7. It's not exactly the same score the way we did it in our research. But you can take a 17-question quiz where you tell them you know, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, what your diet is like, how tall you are, how much you weigh, how old you are, this sort of stuff, whether you smoke cigarettes. And they then give you your score. And this is what the survey looks like. You just kind of pull the drop-down things and put in your, your information. It's really very easy. You don't need to know all your numbers. Of course, I advocate everybody knows their numbers. Know what your cholesterol and blood pressure are and what your blood sugar is. But if you don't know, you can just leave it blank, and, and that's OK. And at the end, you get a score that looks like this. And for each of those seven factors, it gives you a red light, yellow light, green light kind of indication. You're doing well if you're green. You're intermediate if you're yellow. And you're poor if you're red. And it gives you ideas for how you might change. So the next page shows part of my report. And it tells you for each of the factors, I'm just showing the four of them here, where you are. So I was yellow for a few, with the diet, of course. Um, and my weight was kind of yellow. And it gives you a menu of things you could choose to change. And it asks you to make a little X mark for things you think you might be able to do, like eat smaller portions and less food per day. You know, simple things. Um, eat at least one fruit and vegetable with every meal. OK? So it gives you ideas for what you might do. And then it, you can save the document as a PDF on your computer, or you can print it out. You could take it to your doctor, or you could just ignore it because you don't care. Um, <laughs> but this is what it does. And when this was released, remember I told you the story about how excited I got when it came out? Um, I was so excited, I sent it to everyone in my address book on the email, sent the link 
to all my friends and my family and my colleagues. And my sister got the email, and she's right here. Um, this picture was taken probably 10 years ago. That's my, me, I had long hair, and my sister. This picture was taken just a couple years ago. That's our niece, and there's my sister here. And you can see um, she looks a little heavier. As she's gotten older, she's gained some weight. And um, she took the quiz, the My Life Check, a couple years ago when I sent it to her at the age of 41. And she realized she hadn't been feeling quite so well, so she went to her doctor because she didn't know her numbers. She didn't, couldn't fill in all the questions. She had high blood pressure. She had no idea. She's a young mother taking care of her kids, working full time, cleaning the house, you know, doing the things women do. Women care for people. They don't always care for themselves. So she was diagnosed with high blood pressure and put on medication. And of course, the intervention she needs is weight loss. Um, but it's really, this is why this tool can be helpful. Um, so I would encourage all of you to go do the My Life Check um, if you have a computer. And if you don't, go to the library, use a computer. Um, I think you can actually use computers over at the hospital or at the library here, the medical library. Yeah. Yep, and we have resources if you need that kind of help. We can help you with that. So to kind of wrap up, um, the Heart Association and other similar organizations are working very hard to address health status and prevention. Um, we believe this will impact many chronic diseases. There's mixed progress so far, but I'm really optimistic on this. It's going to take all of us to do it. So I hope as I've been talking, some of you have thought of ideas that you might um, bring to your friends or colleagues to your church group, to wherever, um, of things that, that might make your loved ones and friends uh, more healthy, and that you can share some of this with them. And before I open it up to questions, I just want to acknowledge some people. This is our regards study group. Um, here we are down at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and we have people from several centers across the United States working on this study. And um, I just want to share that with you. And, it takes a herd of researchers to do a study like this. It takes a lot of people to make it work, and a lot of staff. Um, and here is our group at the University of Vermont. We're located over at the Colchester Research Facility um, over near Costco, and you can see us. We have a, a regards poster there, which was made up for us by the people in Alabama. When we finished recruiting the 30,000 people, they sent us this beautiful big poster. Um, and you can see the whole team of people from various centers around the country, including the National Institute of, Stroke, of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke, which is the NIH Institute that studies um, stroke and um, cognitive disorders, which is closed today. Claudia is furloughed. <laughs> it's really awful. I'm going to a, a meeting tomorrow in Washington for another study um, that we've been working on um, for a little longer than regards, actually. And um, we're still going, but our NIH colleagues that we work with won't be at our meeting. It's, it's a meeting to work on the study and the progress of the study, and they won't be there because they're not allowed to, to come to work. Um, there's been various grants, all from the NIH, that have helped funded this research. And of course, those grants get cut when things like sequesters occur, um, and it's a major problem um, right now in our country. So not to get too political. But you can see how I am passionate about that issue. So I would encourage you to go to My Life Check, and I'd like to open it up for some discussion. If people have ideas about things they might think they want to do, we'd be happy to hear about them. Or if you just have questions, um, we'd be happy to, to answer those as well. So thank you so much for coming tonight. of heart disease is a risk factor in and of itself. And unfortunately, we not yet, we can't change our genes or really even identify, most of the time we can't identify the genes that are important beyond 
the classical risk factors. So, the, you know, the propensity for diabetes and high cholesterol, um, and even smoking and other risk factors is controlled genetically to a certain degree. So, um, so you know, we can control those factors. Um, I think the real revolution in medicine is going to be how to harness genetic information to improve health in a much better way than we're able to now. But yeah, so, so absolutely, it's even more important for a person who's genetically predisposed to have favorable levels here. Sir. Yes. Uh, would the, the addition of a shopping scape uh, be a, a valuable tool? Absolutely. Kind of approach that they've done in that regard. So the question is, when you go to stores like Walmart, you see more obese people than you see in a lecture like this. Part of that is the socioeconomic status of people who choose to attend a lecture like this and who, who have to shop at Walmart. Um, and the question is, can you change the shopping scape? And absolutely you can. So, and um, there are places that do this. Grocery stores are the best place to do this. So if you take the sugary cereals and put them out of the eyesight of people who are this tall, <laughs> you know, they're not gonna say, oh, mommy, can I have that whatever, apple jacks. <laughs> There's never been a sugary cereal in my house either. Um, if you have those products out of the way, um, you're not gonna, you're gonna be less likely to purchase them. If the healthy products are at eye level, you're gonna be more likely to purchase them. So there are ways to engineer the shopping environment that are up to businesses to do. But if any of you have connections with local shops and stores, convenience stores or what have you, or if you own one, you could position things the same way. And the business isn't gonna lose money from it. People still have to buy food. Right? They're going to buy food, um, but position it in a way. And this was a big issue with the sugar sweetened beverage tax. The grocers were very unhappy with us because they felt that it would reduce their income. But there's actually, actually no evidence that that happened. They said the same thing when tobacco taxation came in, and it didn't happen. There's more convenience stores now by far than there were um, before tobacco taxation. So the question is, can I comment on prescribing of lipid-lowering drugs like Lipitor, which is one of the most common ones, and whether it's better to do lifestyle changes before, and is it worth taking those medications? And really, it's an individualized decision between a patient and their physician. But we have very clear guidelines of how to treat high cholesterol. And I believe that the statin drugs, which Lipitor is, is one of, are a revolutionary good thing for our society. They have been hugely responsible for those curves I showed you of the declining death rates from cardiovascular disease and stroke. So they're very important medications for people who need them. The first line treatment of high cholesterol is dietary change and weight loss. The problem is that doesn't change it a huge amount. So you might be able to change it by 10 or 15% with that, and for a lot of people, that's not near enough of where they need to go for whatever reason, because maybe they're genetically predisposed or maybe they can't control their diet or their weight very well. So the effectiveness is, is worth doing. It's always the first step. But the medications are often needed. And there's a reason why there's talk about putting them over the counter, um, because they're very effective. So, and the side effect profiles are very good. There are some people who develop side effects, but, but it's very low. Yes? Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Yeah. Is there any relationship between the statin drugs and high blood sugar? Yes. Yes. So the question is, is there a relationship of the statin drugs with high blood sugar? And the answer is yes. 
So um, in studies using statins for prevention of cardiovascular disease in healthy people, there is this very slight increased risk of diabetes occurring in the people on statins, but it's very small. The absolute benefit, sort of the risk-benefit ratio is in favor of treatment. And in healthy people, um, the use of statins is extremely effective in reducing death rates from, from cardiovascular disease. So, so it's, it's sort of worth the trade-off of that small risk. But it's something, of course, that you want to monitor. So you don't want to just take your statin prescription and then never see your doctor again. Or eat crap, <laughs> right? <laughs> Taking a statin doesn't mean you can eat whatever you want. You, you still need to watch your weight and your diet. Yes? I always like to use a lot of sugar and salt. So I substitute potassium salt for the sodium salt and uh, sweet loaf for the sugar. Yes. Using equally amount. Uh, and uh, I wonder if there's any hope for a, uh, a drug to curb the appetite. A drug to curb the appetite. <laughs> huh. so, so this gentleman is saying that he replaces um, salt with potassium chloride, which is a salt substitute, and he replaces sugar with sweet and low. I'm an equal person myself, and I know my friend Dr. Tracy likes Splenda, um, but I'm all for sugar substitutes. I think there's no evidence that they're dangerous. Um, and you want to know, is there a drug to curb the appetite? Well, um, that might be something that might come down the line in the future. There's a lot of research going on on the control of appetite and the neurohormones um, in the circulation that are related to ap appetite, as well as, you know, the adipose tissue, the fat tissue, is an organ. And it releases chemicals or, or substances that circulate that affect things like appetite. So um, there's hope for that. But I think, actually, what I have found in my life is the best thing to curb my appetite is exercise. When I'm, I go through phases, and when I'm exercising more, I find I eat less. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, if you cut down salt, we worry about having low iron. Iodine. Iod oh, iodine. Yeah. I'm not a dietitian, so I'm not sure I can comment on that, to be honest. But I don't think you probably eat enough to make a difference. Does someone know the answer better than I do? I'm sorry. Eat seafood. Eat seafood, yeah. Exact shellfish. In moderation, like everything. Yes. So um, it's very hard. So what? So the question is: Is anybody addressing the salt in the prepared foods, like they did in the UK? And there are projects around that. Um, it's really hard to shop because, first of all, our food labeling is terrible. You have to turn the thing over and look at the back, and you have to do math in your head to figure out what product is healthier. So if you're looking at, if you want to buy some soup, right, I spend like 20 minutes there looking at all the different cans, trying to figure out which one is the best because they have serving size. You know, maybe the serving size is a half a cup for one of them, it's two-thirds of a cup for another one, or it's a cup. And you've got to figure out the milligrams of sodium. Then you've got to add it up and think, well, 1,500 a day is what I'm aiming for. How can I achieve that? Well, if you shop the perimeter of the store, the, the, um, the fruit and vegetable area and the deli area and the dairy part, and don't go in the middle, you'll be fine. Although, although, I learned, I learned recently down in Dallas when I was at a meeting for the Heart Association uh, about something that they're calling the Salty Six, and I actually meant to make a slide about this. They have an education campaign about the Salty Six. It's the six foods that have the most sodium um, contributing to high sodium in our diet, and poultry is one of them. 
And I was sitting around this meeting, <laughs> and I just basically said to my colleagues, I am in poultry shock, right? Because I thought chicken is healthy, but they actually inject it with sodium so that it stays moist and gets water in it and it weighs more. <laughs> and I'm not really sure how to tell which poultry has more sodium than another because they label it funny. They put the percent water. <laughs> if you look at the labels, they don't always say how much sodium. <laughs> and so it's very, very tricky. It's, it's really, really hard. That's why nobody has a good sodium. We have twice the sodium we're supposed to have. So it's very, very difficult. Um, you have to sort of do math or not buy the stuff. The Heart Association does review food, um, food products, and they have this um, program called the Heart Check. You see this little emblem on the food item with a check mark, and that basically means that it meets the Heart Association's criteria for a component of a healthy diet. It doesn't mean it's a perfect food, um, but they do review um, food products for companies and give them the heart check. And they actually test the products. They don't just go by what, what the company says. So if you see that heart check, you know it might be better than a similar item that doesn't have that heart check. Yeah. Thank you, I found most effective, at least in terms of calories, and maybe it could also be used for sodium, is at least in restaurants now, or places where they tell you the calories of items you're buying. I mean, number one, I'm normally shocked when I see what yeah. calories are. Right, so um, that's a great point. So the question is, it's really a statement more that the menu labeling on the, of the calories in restaurants, that you find it helpful to see. So when you go, it's, it's really, it's legislated in Vermont, actually. It's the law that fast food restaurants have to show you the calories. So McDonald's, Burger King, um, Applebee's, Starbucks, the fast food chain restaurants have to put it up there. The, the interesting thing is they're, um, I'm not aware of research studies that show it changes the behavior. And I've actually had discussions with people in these shops <laughs> about it. I actually was in McDonald's a couple weeks ago. I admit it. And um, it, it's right near my office, and I sneak in and get a salad sometimes. But, um, but I was in there, and I was looking at the calories. And like you, I'm like, oh my god, that's a lot of calories. Um, and this lady's like, oh, I don't care. <laughs> you know, I'm just hungry. <laughs> So I try my best to, yes? Um, have you learned anything about dietary supplements of calcium and possibly iron uh, increasing the risk of heart disease, especially in men? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So the question is whether dietary supplements of calcium and iron can increase the cardiovascular risk. And I don't really think that that's clear. Um, there are studies about iron status. Um, but why the person's iron status might be different is, is questionable. And so, you know, I think dietary supplements are a fascinating whole uh, topic area that would be great for a talk in this forum because it's really complicated. There's no regulation of dietary supplements, and there's very few high-quality studies of the impact on health. So I'm a little leery about taking anything. I used to take a multivitamin, actually, and... And I was talking to a friend of mine who's a nutritional researcher down at Harvard, and he talked me out of taking it because I eat a pretty healthy diet. Um, and he said, well, you don't need it. Why do you spend your money on it? Um, so I'm, I'm a little leery of most supplements, and I think if you have questions about supplements, it's good to speak with your physician. Calcium, though, for women is very important uh, to prevent osteoporosis and fracture. So, you know, I think it's a difficult question. Yes. Just a question on uh, the way to prepare food. Would uh, baking or broiling or uh, any type of food increase the value? Yeah, so the question is, does it matter how you prepare the food in terms of its health um, quality? Yeah, you know, and again, I'm not a dietitian um, or a nutrition counselor, but for sure, you know, if you fry stuff, that's bad. Um, and if you pour butter all over it, and then bake it. That's probably worse than if you just put maybe a little bit of um, olive oil and, and bake it. Um, so, so yeah, the way you prepare food can certainly affect it. With vegetables, if you boil the bejesus out of your vegetables, 
you're gonna lose the nutrients into the water. So, so yeah, I think you know, there are um, tips about cooking that I probably can't advise completely about, but, but it does matter. Okay. So the question is, um, should you have aspirin available in your home? Crystalloid aspirin, yeah. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that, but certainly an aspirin is the first line treatment in the acute setting of a heart attack or a stroke. So if you really thought you were having a stroke or heart attack and you had aspirin in the house, it's fine to take one on your way to calling 911 or after you've called 911 while you're waiting for them. And aspirin has a very rapid onset of action. So, so it is a good thing to, to do. If you're on Coumadin and... Yeah, so what do you do if you're on Coumadin and you're not supposed to take aspirin? So yeah, that's a good question. So Coumadin, for those who aren't aware, is a blood thinning medication. And yes, you know, I think when you're taking Coumadin, if you're concerned, you probably don't want to do something that you're not supposed to. There are plenty of people around whose doctors do prescribe both Coumadin and aspirin because they need them both. But the risk of bleeding is actually um, higher if you take both. Tylenol is just fine, but it doesn't help your heart, unfortunately. Yes? Yes. So the question is, should we use red light, green light labeling on the foods? And I think the answer is yes. Um, they do this in the UK. Um, so we have these complex things on the back of the package where you have to do math. Um, but if on the front of the package there was a green light <laughs> or a red light to tell you the overall quality, um, that would, I think, be very helpful. I I'm not sure. I know, I, I'm not sure of that. Other questions? Yes? You had the subject here, worksite wellness. Worksite wellness. I'm always amazed when I go into a hospital to see so many overweight people work there. They are literally <laughs> <laughs> So I was wondering, do you have a program in the hospital here to have these people lose weight? Yes, yeah, so the question <laughs> is, that the, this nice lady, she's always amazed when she goes over to the hospital and sees the obesity and overweight at the hospital. It's not just at the hospital, it's everywhere. But, um, and I don't know if the prevalence or the rate is higher in healthcare workers. I wouldn't be surprised because we tend to be uh, work long hours <laughs> but, um, and maybe have less time to take care of ourselves. Um, but yes. Fletcher Allen does have a work, work site wellness programs and they're, they have just started, and I don't know all the details of it, but they have just started a program for incentive for employees who achieve healthy lifestyle and healthy um, risk levels. So, so I think this, it's a great thing. And we know these kind of programs work. Other industries have been ahead of us in doing this, but we know that it cuts um, absenteeism from work to have these kind of programs and it cuts your health insurance costs. You know, business employers like that, you know, if they can get a better deal on health insurance for their employees by having worksite wellness programs and healthier employees, they're gonna save money. So it's worth putting the effort into those kinds of programs if you have a, a small business, for example, or a large business. One last question. Yeah, so the question is that I commented on diet soda and that I thought it was okay and that you've heard stories about um, maybe studies that said diet soda was bad. And um, this, there have been a few reports. There was actually a paper presented at an American Heart Association conference about a year and a half ago on this topic and it got a lot of press. And I saw the presentation. <laughs> 
and the analysis wasn't done right. The paper was presented at the meeting. It wasn't yet published in a journal. So in science, the indication that our work has been done right most of the time is that it gets accepted for publication by a peer reviewer or a group of peer reviewers, other scientists in our discipline who have reviewed it with a fine tooth comb to make sure everything was done right and that the results are right. And in that particular instance, which maybe is where you heard this, um, the analysis wasn't done right. And the paper, I think, still hasn't been published because they're trying to figure out how to do the analysis correctly. So there really is no evidence of it. You know, years and years ago, I remember with saccharin that there were studies in animals that it caused cancer and all of this. But you had to give them mega huge amounts. So, so this is why I don't have any qualms about it. Now, I could be wrong. You know, science is a continually evolving field. And so we don't ever know the right answer, even when we think we know the right answer. Because a year later, somebody might come up with a different answer that's more right. That's what science is all about. And so, so we can't be sure. Water, we know is safe. Nothing wrong with water, unless you get, you can have water intoxication. But water is free, too. I mean, we live in Vermont. You know, we can open the tap and get really good tasting, clean water in Vermont. So, and it doesn't cost anything. So, well, maybe you're modest, you have a water bill. But, um, but you know, water is certainly something to advocate. All right, well, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And there are displays outside um, about the community medical school and resources here. And we have a table from the American Heart Association with our volunteers who are medical students here who'd be happy to answer questions. And there's literature there about the Simple Seven with brochures and stuff that I would encourage you to take. If you want to take extra copies, that's fine too. You can give them to your friends. So thanks for coming.